Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 255 for Monday, May 4th, 2020. Folks, and welcome back to Gig Gab, the show that's by, for, and about working musicians here, as always, these days in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. San, San Jose, California. It's Paul Kent. How you doing today, Mr. Paul Kent? I'm doing good. My buddy's on the line with us. Yeah, Brad Maddox. Uh, thanks for joining us, Brad. I'll, we'll, we'll introduce who you are in a moment. But Brad, thanks for, thanks for coming on the show. Uh, thanks for having me. Hi, guys. Uh, hey. Uh, so, so, Brad, you... Um, your career these days, uh, and for many years, for many decades, has been doing front of house sound for lots of bands, many that we've heard of, many that we haven't, including uh, Rush, Queen, Queensryche, Florence and the Machine, uh, and the list goes on and on. Is that is that is that a, a place to start at least? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to say yes. I'm on advice of my lawyer. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and you also I'm have. Gonna, I'm going to actually jump right in here because yeah. I, I just want to gush about my friend here. A uh, Grammy-nominated, twice a Parnelli Award-winning um, uh, engineer, uh, engineer of the year, twice a Touring Top Dog Award winner. I mean, Brad, you know, over we know each other what forty-five years now. The last what thirty years you've been out? Forty years, thirty thirty-six years, I think. Right? You, you graduated in uh, from Berkeley in uh, eighty-five, eighty-four. Uh, well, let's be clear. I didn't actually graduate. I'm one of the the mo- many people who went for four years and didn't get a diploma and left and went on the road. I didn't know that. That's funny. <laughs> You're still on a break, um, huh? <laughs> I'm st- yeah, I've, I've taken a gap three decades. <laughs> <laughs> a gap lifetime. There's nothing wrong with it. I'm doing the same thing, man. It's all good. I, I think I left off my resume that I went to high school with Paul Kent. That's, That's big. One thing. So, you know, it is big. It, it should be right above Grammy nominated. Right. right exactly. <laughs> anyway, you kind of, you know, you're at the, you're at the top of your profession. You've built this amazing career. Your tour with all these absolutely top-notch tours. Your reputation is huge. I've read I've read articles about you in you know in mixing magazines that type of stuff. You've built you know pretty remarkable career. Do you know many people who've been doing it as long as you? Um. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, several anyway. Uh, there, we're we're a dying breed. No, I didn't mean that literally. But, <laughs> um, risky, risky joke these days, right? Uh, yeah, I know, right? Uh, there's uh, plenty of young guns coming up, which is great. That's great, and women too, which is also great. Yep, yeah, that's cool. So, so my ahead, first Paul. question for yeah. you is this: So, I remember you and me playing music together in garages, and then you went off to this fancy college, and then you started doing tours. Tell me again, your first tour was um, was a band that I really liked, wasn't it? Was it a John Cafferty? Uh, John Cafferty and the Beaver Brown Band was w- probably the first real tour that I did. I'd, I'd been out on the road a little bit before that, but um, there uh, it was at the time when the movie. Uh, Eddie and the Cruises had just come out and it was blowing up on HBO. And um, they actually, I believe if I have my history right, they had another record already done, but suddenly their previous record became extremely popular, especially in the college circuit. So we did a lot of uh, like college basketball arena type oh, wow. gigs. It went from being kind of nothing to being extremely popular. And um, I wasn't, I wasn't mixing them at the time. Uh, but there was a time at sort of well on in the tour where the, the front house engineer just left for personal reasons. And, um, they pointed at me and said, you know how to set up the PA (laughs) 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 you mix (laughs) and, you know, um, fake it till you make it. Right. And I mean, I knew how to operate the console and stuff. So, and a lot of the work had already been done. So it was just kind of, uh, stepped in and there were, the rest is history more or less. And what would you say those were like when you said basketball arenas, like two, 3000 seats were pretty typical or more. Yeah. I mean, there was, they were very, very popular for that, that year. Um, so, I mean, imagine, I mean, some of those places are really big, Paul, like, uh, he was going through the Midwest and playing in, uh, Norman, Oklahoma, the, the you know, their basketball arena is probably 12 to 15,000. Ah. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. Oh. And uh, it was miles bigger than the biggest thing I'd ever mixed before, which was probably the 
bun ratties, like, which might hold 200 people. <laughs> so, so <laughs> any, any chance you remember what board you were mixing with on that first tour? Yeah, it was the, the PM1D. The PM1, excuse me. PM1000, excuse me. <laughs> the, uh, the kind of the first... Well, man, not the first, but like one of the first it fully integrated uh, Yamaha mixing consoles. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. So, so you, you know, there you go in, in a matter of, let's say months, right? You, you're going from mixing a, a room of 200 people to a room of 15,000 people. Uh, yes, the board was all set up for you, but, but only in a general sense, right? I mean, you're bringing this thing to a different town every night. You're setting up the system, yeah. not just you, but, but, you know, a crew. And EQ. No, it was ju- it was just me. Just- <laughs> wow. <laughs> All right. Well, there you go. So, I, like, how did what was that difference like? That I mean, I know once it's all going, the band's on stage, everything's rocking. There's there's lots to do, but there's also lots to do to get it set up. As everybody listening knows, you know, you not only do you have to like hang the PA, but and run all the cables and all of that. But then you've got to tune to the room, and and I have to imagine that that going from 200 to 15,000 people that that part of the job gets a whole lot more dicey is that like how did you deal with that yeah well for one thing we didn't hang the pa um, <laughs> you stacked it <laughs> this is going back we're going back a ways here guys okay, um, yeah 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 um, uh but you know the challenges for, were there for sure for yeah. as far as tuning in a basketball arena and i mean we had way less technology then than we have now right so it was a pair of 31 band graphic eqs and uh you know i would put on a uh, a cassette tape <laughs> and play it back and uh listen to the room and it was pretty much by ear back then there was yep. really not a lot of uh you know feedback you could get from a piece of gear let alone a computer Right. Right. Um, this, was, this was like 1984-ish. So like, uh, there were no computers to speak of. Right. Were, like any, any, any memorable disasters in that early phase of like, I think I got it right. And now the band's on stage and, oh, turns out, no, I don't. Like, you know. Any- um, I can remember, I'm going to forget which sure. venue, but I can remember stacking the PA in a place and... Uh, I don't know where were we, but the, for whatever reason, the people at this particular venue were all really tall and you know, in the empty room, it sounded as good as it was going to be. And usually it gets better, but for whatever reason, and you know, I'm not really tall and they, the band started playing. I was like, Whoa, where did it go? <laughs> I can't hear <laughs> yeah. anything, let alone, is it right or not? Um, I mean, I don't know how you predict for that. Uh, yeah. Other than other than it taught me to put the PA as high as possible, right. and, and of course, not long after that, we were flying PA, so yeah. that was not really an issue. But no, but that is an issue for you know for folks listening mm-hmm. to the show. I mean, most of us aren't flying PA's. Most of us are are stacking them, and if you're not above the 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 general, maybe not the tallest person in the room, but if you're not above the the general height of the crowd, you got a major problem. Yeah. Yeah, we did start a policy of when we were stacking PAs, we would actually put extra bass bins up and it had nothing to do with needing more bass. It was about getting the high mid cabinets above the crowd. Yeah. Uh, for that very reason, just based on that experience, you know. Well, it makes sense, man. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> the things yeah. you learn. Well, and I I yeah, mean I guess the hard way. Yeah, the, well, but but <laughs> like that's how you cut your teeth, right? Is is yeah. learning that way is, you know, okay, well, I'm not going to make that mistake again. So, yeah. Uh, that's how you did cut your teeth then. I think now you're yeah, you're more likely to be mentored or shadow somebody or, you know, I think there's a lot more collective experience and amongst sure. sound engineers in general. Like we know now, not you don't do that. If you don't, Who would you, know. you point back to as your first good professional mentor? I was a fellow named Ted Leamy. Um, on that on that same tour, uh, for a spell, we opened up for Foreigner. It was on their four tour. Um, and, uh, I was kept on actually at that point, I wasn't even mixing, but, um, I was kept on, I basically drove the truck and tuned the piano, drove drove the band gear from town to town, tuned the piano. And, um, the system technician on that tour, it was Electrotech was the sound company. And it was a guy named Ted Leamy who went on to be president of JBL. And, uh, I've kind of lost touch with it. Actually, I don't sure what he's doing right now, but, um, he was 
uh, taught me a lot about, uh, you know, like I kind of came in and watched what was going on. He taught me a lot about what was going on and the work ethic. And then he wound up being a system technician on, but, you know, I really like pulled for him to be system technician on the early tours that I did where I was more in charge of what was happening. And uh, he taught me a lot. A lot of it has to do with, not so much audio stuff, but, but like, you know, being on time and being professional and being uh, a pro. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so well, that's cool. So uh, we started with uh, Cafferty. I remember you did a, like a small tour in the early days of um, Bruce Hornsby. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Later on, actually uh, I did, but yeah, I did tour two tours with Hornsby and worked on one record in the studio with him. Yeah. And, and then over the years, I've come and visited you for Shania Twain, I think Shakira. And then, you know, I just, and then actually, I think you did me a favor and I had one of my bandmates come out when you did that Nine Inch Nails Queen's Rag tour. Is that right? Nine Inch Nails, uh, Jane's Addiction. That's ah. it. Jane's Addiction. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which was a really fun tour to be a part of. It's, it's two bands that you might not put together in your mind, but it actually was a really, really good show. And that just sounds like a lot of technology. Was there, was there a ton of technology thrown at that show? Uh, surely on the nine inch nails side, um, Jane's addiction was a little more, uh, loosey goosey technology wise, although, you know, still a lot. And it was kind of also, uh, you know, if there was really only two or three digital consoles in the market and we were, we were touring with one. And, um, so yeah, the technology had definitely, taken a step up since since uh john cafferty days no doubt <laughs> for sure yeah i so think you, a- yeah, you came to the, the shania twain show the one shania twain show where we had we're having this horrendous buzz i day. remember that and we could not for the life of us figure out what was causing it i remember i was sitting with you as you were as you were starting to figure out what, it, what the heck that is that and just it was i just my reflection so that's quite a while ago that's maybe 20 years ago right it would have been uh, oh Four, it was two oh two somewhere in there. It's the up right. two or whatever that yeah, was. Yeah. So um, I just remember my reflection was it was interesting to see my friend at work, but it was clear that something was going on, mm-hmm. and it was I, I was just fascinated by how how mellow you were about it. Like actually not mellow, methodical. And you had a you had an engineer that was working with you that yet you were trying to find what was going on. Mm-hmm. But it was a it was a very calm thing, and I'm like, you know the other band's going to come sound check in a few minutes. What's he going to do? What's he going to do? But you were pretty chill about it. And that, that was one of the bigger things that you've had to deal with. That was certainly a very problematic show. Um, I mean, and it's the kind of thing that happens from time to time. And um, I, I would go back to that learning uh, from Ted Leamy about that was also part of it. He, he told me one time, never run towards a fire, uh, which it was just a matter of like, keep your head, look around you and, and, and be calm. It doesn't mean you're not concerned. It just means you're, you're trying to reason your way through the issue and be logical because it's always, I mean, it's always something technical and you have right. to, yeah. uh, and I think in that case, we never fully got rid of it. I think we kind of just minimized it to whatever degree we could. And of course it was gone the next show. So of course. You know. Well, that, that's <laughs> it was, the, it was that, clearly San Jose. That's yeah. the worst part of, of any kind of technical troubleshooting, right? Is if it only happens once it, it lingers in the back of your mind, but you know, I can't obsess over this until I hear it again and then go and try and fix it. Yeah. So one, one thing about live performance that I like is that every day is its own day. And you can have a bad night and it, at the end of the night it's over right. and you you go and you have a slice of pizza and a beer and you get on the bus and you go to the next town and start over. So, you know, the bad nights are few and far between, but they happen and sure. you, you just sort of learn to move on. Yeah. You well, yeah, that's part of being a professional, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Is, is don't let it get to you. Just start the next day and, and, uh, hopefully things, yeah, don't, yeah. things don't go sideways yeah. twice in a row. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to address the elephant in the room here. And that elephant is that, um, for many years, my pal Brad has been the front of house mixing engineer for a band that my buddy Dave happens to love more than anything else in the world. So Brad, could you share a little bit about how you got involved at Rush? Yeah, Rush. Um, I was shortly after the Def Leppard tour. I was on Hysteria. I wasn't the engineer. I was on the sound crew. It was back uh, when I was kind of working my way up to that level. Um, Ted Leamy was on that tour as well, yeah. and he 
uh, the engineer for that, uh, a fellow named Robert Scoville, moved on to Rush on the uh, Presto tour. And I mixed the opening band. It's a band called Mr. Big. And um, Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so I we had actually tour. a guy from the Bay Area here who played. So Mr. Big is Eric Martin, right? Yeah, yes. yes. And we have a local guy here in the Bay Area who has a local kind of corporate cover band, Dan Meblin. And Dan played with Eric Martin when it was the mm-hmm. Eric Martin band when we were in right. Yeah. right, right. Really a pleasure to mix those guys. Great band, great players. Eric's a fantastic singer. Um, but I, uh, over the course of that tour, uh, it was, you know, a big learning moment for me, but I, I got um, asked to do the Queens Rock Empire tour, which was starting up after that rush tour ended. Uh, I guess they, somebody came and saw the Mr. Big set and thought it was, it was sounded good. So I deserved a shot at that. And that was kind of my first That's big, awesome. like I'm on my own mixing a tour tour. And, um, uh, that, uh, led to basically everything that happened after that. Um, I kind of forgot the question. <laughs> I was going to start with Rush. Oh, with Rush. Uh, after that, uh, Robert moved on to do Tom Petty and, um, I had worked with, uh, Rush once or twice kind of filling in for him. So they asked me, uh, they took a hiatus, about four year hiatus. And, uh, when they started back up with the paper trails album and, oh uh, boy, what was that? 2004, five, I uh, think. Yeah. Yeah. Somewhere yeah. in there. Yeah. 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 Huh. They, uh, they called me to do it and I, uh, did that tour and every tour after that. Ah, that was a special tour for them coming mm-hmm. back too. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Big, there was a huge moment. I was there in Hartford. When, in Hartford, yes. Yeah. That was our first show back. And it was really special, actually, that show. Really special. Um, you, you could feel wow. how much the band loved playing for their fans and how much the fans loved seeing them back. You know, it was a really cool, it was it, a pivotal moment. It I was, for, for, I, yeah, I, 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 it is, I've seen a lot of concerts and a lot of rush concerts too, <laughs> but mm-hmm. that's one of those moments when they took the stage, it was like, Oh, wait a minute. Like they, they noticed this too. It's we're all here in this. This is pretty cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Your relationships with the guys in the band, I, from what it sounded like to me, transcended with many, you know, kind of engineer band member really. I mean, they were at your wedding and, you know, it oh, no was actually, you know, it was actually, you, you have a long-term, very close relationship with those guys. Uh, they, they, uh, became friends. Uh, um, they, they were, we developed this sort of thing. I, I, I kind of was really blessed to be more than just their sound guy. I was kind of the, audio producer for live really is kind of what they started calling me. And, um, uh, we spent a lot of time rehearsing those tours. You know, we would be in a, uh, a building together for four or five weeks leading up to the tour and then, and then, uh, production rehearsals. And, um, there was a lot, they placed a lot of trust in me. I was fortunate to have that. And, and along the way we, we did become, you know, uh, very friendly. I'm in a professional way, but, uh, sure. You know, I, I see them from when I go to Toronto and still, and, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it was a really, really, uh, special relationship for me. Well, that's good. Well, then I, I will say my condolences to you on, Thank on you. the loss of your friend. Yeah. It, and it, you know, uh, to, to speak a little bit to that, just as someone on the, the very outside, the fact that, that Neil Peart was sick for as long as he was and nothing ever leaked out even a little bit, I think mm-hmm. speaks to just how much you said trust, but the camaraderie and the respect that, that the industry has, not just the, the, you know, kind of the rush camp and the rush family, but that the industry has. Cause you, you know, that there were people that, that found out about this, that just decided, yeah, we're, we're, we're not going to, we're going to go ahead and respect that. I, I, I well, it was very yeah, impressive. Well, yeah, we all knew he was, well, we all, yeah. I knew he was sick. Sure. Uh, I think there was a quite a few people in the camp that knew. Sure. And we also knew he was a, a, a private person. He didn't want a lot of, of the attention that comes along with being a rock star. And right. um, we respected that. And um, I wasn't surprised to learn he'd passed away. I, I felt like it was coming. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we were, you know, nobody would have broken that trust. I mean, it would, that was a 
is close to, I always say like, it, it, it was like being on a team. So not like family, but being on a really close team, close sure. knit team. But it was like, not like being on, you know, a little league team or yeah, <laughs> it was like being part of the, the Yankees, you know, yeah. it was not, it was, we took that very seriously. We took that trust very seriously. Yeah. Cool. Well, and, and I mean, the fact that he lived in LA and it didn't leak out there uh, right. it speaks to the industry's respect for him beyond the camp. But, but again, not sure. to minimize the, the camp. All right. Um, I, I have a question. I might as well ask it about Rush, but it, it's a, a general question. Mixing a band like that. Now, certainly, you know, they uh, could easily be described as control freaks, at least knowing from the outside world and that they were very exact. Thing. But they also sounded like they were very much col good collaborators and team players with a band like that. How much control does the artist have over what you are doing to their sound every night? Like, wh where does that line? How does that get negotiated? I guess is a is a is a better question. Well, funny. Their ears out front, I guess, is another way to ask that. Like, well, they're sound checking. How do they know what's yeah. you know, who who communicates what the band would want to you? Or does anybody? Well, a lot of that happened in... Well, I'll tell you a couple of stories. That, that, a lot of that happened in rehearsals. Sure. Um, so one story was uh, Getty has, uh, for for a bass guitar, is a fairly sophisticated yeah. sound. It's a it's a handful of inputs, and they blend together in a, a, a certain way. And just to break it down, one is one input is very, very clean. So basically directly off the bass guitar. Uh, another input is... Uh, sort of gritty and it's blended in. And then there's a, there's actually two others that are substantially distorted and they get blended in in a certain way. And while I was working with them, uh, um, there, we were developing multi-track recording technologies. Actually they had been doing that before I came along, but uh, it, it had gotten substantially better. Um, Getty used to step into the control room every once in a while to listen to a song and play along with it or like, I mean, I think people would always, I always think people would be shocked at the level of which the bands are actually learning their songs when they're, when they're in this part of the process. And yeah, um, we had a, a moment where he came in and we talked about the bass sound and uh, I was playing it back. And at one point I, I pulled all the faders down and said, well, there, just put it, you put it how you like it you know, let's, let's talk about it from your perspective instead of me trying to translate it. And, um, he ran the faders up and moved, moved them up and down a little bit and said, there, I like that sound. And, you know, we were listening to multi-track playback when he was doing that. And, it, and literally from that moment on, those faders did not move. The, that was the sound. That was right. the sound Getty liked. And he's the one that, that, uh, threw it up. So, I think that that contributes to the trust that they actually have heard, uh, you know, what they're, you know, what it is that they're doing. Another story, also a rush story. Um, one of the later tours, a clockwork angels tour, we had a string section and, and that yeah. was a big leap for those guys that they, they had never toured with. I don't think they'd ever toured with anybody that wasn't one of the three guys. There had not ever been another musician playing a note of music with them uh, as they right. said. Right. Yeah. So, so now there's eight other people on the stage and, uh, they had made a record that had a lot of strings on it and they'd hired, um, oh, I'm blanking on his name. They had hired an arranger. Okay. And I, I'm really embarrassed. I'm blanking on his name. Uh, anyway, uh, David Campbell, I think is his name. And he, uh, he wrote a bunch of string parts, but he wrote like, he basically wrote a bunch of string parts that were not on the record. Um, I mean the ones that were, he, sure. ma he made them, but he, he kind of, uh, uh added his own take on it and our problem was that his take on it was really really good and we had gone into rehearsals thinking that the strings were going to augment stuff was get it was that getty was playing on the keyboards but quickly realized that that wasn't going to happen so now we had to actually really capture a, a, the strings as an ensemble as a fourth member of the band yeah and we had uh we were all a little, including me, a little <laughs> petrified. <laughs> and uh, we did the same thing. We had uh, the band came in and played and they were rehearsing. I was recording everything. And there was a moment where we all stood out in, in the arena and I played back to them. And, you know, what you hear in, in 
the main PA system is substantially different from what you hear in monitors, and it's no slag on monitor engineers. They're they're well, giving a, the band what they need to it's play, a which is not always right. it, it's not always the mix, right? Right, right. Um, yeah, you you often wouldn't want the mix in no, your ears I, or on a, a, in a wedge. Yeah, yeah. So um, we all stood out there and listened to it, and I'm happy to say that they were really impressed with how it was, how it all came together uh, in a mix. So, uh, you know, mission accomplished, I guess, but I'm not sure. So that's where that trust comes from is for me has been, um, it, it's an interesting job front of house. It's the one job where the guys on the stage really have no idea how well you're doing. You know, right. you can see, you can hear if the guitar is not in tune or you can see if the lights are not flashing in time, but you're standing on stage just sort of hoping that what's going out there is is good. So it was a, a big leap forward to be able to play back multi-track live. Oh, um, right. Because prior to that, they just truly had to trust uh, that it was, it was right. I mean, I'm sure they had friends and family that would hear the show every now and then, but they never got to hear it. Yeah. Well, and we had those moments too, where, um, not with not with Rush so much, but it just generally with bands sure. like that. Somebody's friend showed up, and <laughs> I have oh, another story that with Mr. Big actually in L.A. Um, uh, had a lot of friends show up to the show, and and after the show, I went back. I would always go back and talk to the band, and uh, one by one, they came up to me and and sort of laughingly said, "Hey, my friend couldn't hear my instrument," you know. And they all <laughs> did it, <laughs> and I was laughing. I'm laughing because they, it's impossible for nobody to hear any of you. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and um, at, pretty much at that moment, we were all kind of giggling about it. Pretty much at that moment, the, the Kevin Nelson who'd produced the record came in and they said, well, how did it sound? And he said words to this effect. Um, well, it sounded great, but you guys played horribly. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> oh, I, I, I'm not sure if he was kidding. Also, sure. but it was it was a it was a funny moment. Yeah. But back then, it was like you would record the show to a CD and give the band or or a cassette yeah. again and give it to the band, and they would listen. And you know, it wasn't really a great representation necessarily of how it really sounded. And you would uh, maybe they'd make some notes, and you'd get a, the next show or something. And um, you know, it, it's really a game changer to sit down with a band and say, look, this is what you guys played in the levels you played it at. And here's what I'm doing to it. And, yeah. you know, go ahead and, and let's, let's point at what frequency is bothering you and your guitar or whatever. And let's, let's fix it. Let's but fix it's it. hard to do, hard to do when uh, somebody listens to the CD and just kind of says, well, I don't know, the guitar sounds a little um, glassy or something. It's, you know, <laughs> a nice well, and, word and they're not you get to interpret. Yeah. yeah they're not mm -hmm. getting the sound of the room either. I mean, it's right. There's right. So, yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. 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 But you were cool enough to have me uh, for that last rush show in San Jose, the rush 40 show mm -hmm. uh, for sound check. And I remember at that show, Digidesign had brought out a console that they wanted you to try out. Oh, yeah. And, do you remember the first time um, manufacturers started coming to you and saying, Hey, we've got some cool gear. You want to know about it. Do you remember the first time that happened? Yeah. Um, on Queensryche, not the first tour I did with them, but uh, I had a, uh, I had a friend actually that had gotten a job with a uh, audio technica and he said, Hey, we're coming out with some new large diaphragm condensers. And, you know, there was a time around then where manufacturers of high end gear, I'm doing air quotes here. Uh, <laughs> um, we're sort of looked down on live or like you wouldn't take this out live, you know, um, you know, like high end compressors or you name it. Sure. Uh, you know, this is for the studio kind of vibe. And in my memory, that was one of the first times that a manufacturer was making, taking sort of, types of mics like large diaphragm condenser mics that were really meant for the studio and building them to be used live. And, mm. uh, he said, I'm going to send you a box of mics. I want you to try them out in rehearsals. Huh? And we put, um, we put both mics on the guitars and, uh, invited the band into, to listen while they played. And we went back and forth and, um, there wasn't a single person that didn't think, the new mic sounded better. Ah. The, the, and that was like, that was a real, and generally in the business, but that moment in particular, but generally in the business, that's when we really started to see 
you know, manly variable mu compressors show up and live. And um, I'm not saying I broke the ground for it. Sure. But th- around that era, that, that, time, that yeah. stuff started to happen. Yeah. Uh-huh. So <laughs> you, you mentioned large dive. I'm going to get geeky for a second. I, mm-hmm. it, it, on a rock band club stage, the idea of using a large diaphragm condenser or really in any kind of condenser comes with that. Well, be careful, you know, don't gain it up too much. Otherwise you're never going to get it under control. Mm -hmm. We're on, on a, you know, on bigger touring stages. Are you using condensers pretty, pretty freely everywhere? Really? Yeah. And ribbons too, which is another mic you would never have used uh, 25 years, 30 years ago. Really? Uh, So how do you get those things under control? Years of practice. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Fair. Fair. Yeah. Well, well don't suck. Yeah. Um, well, so I'll throw this out there. I don't always. But, sure. Uh, of course. Um, a, they're made much with for well, two things. First of all, they're made much better now, I and mean, the materials that go into it and the pattern. I mean, they have ribbon mics that are uh, pattern controlled now, which you didn't oh, have. Wow. Yeah. Uh, right. Okay. They ha- they have. Uh, you know, you can switch large diaphragm condensers to uh, hyper hypercardioid. I mean, it's, they're just sort of engineered way better. Yeah. And the other side of the coin is these mics were five hundred dollars, not five thousand dollars. Sure. Uh, right. So, and again, I think you could attribute that to the manufacturing that was going that had gotten better. Yeah. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm actually interested over the course of your 35 years of doing this. What are some of the milestones of like? game-changing technology and in, in live sound. You're talking about some of them now, but if you kind of like draw that arc about things that were like, oh, this is a, this is big. What are some of the tech points that you think were, were the most fascinating? Well, two, one of which was um, a sound system design, which is basically the uh, advent of what we call line array huh. yeah. PAs, which is not really the right name for them, but that's what we all call them now. So, um, that the theory was uh, uh, put forth by uh, Christian Heil at some point, like uh, in the nineties, I think was that if you, if you uh, cover enough of the baffle of a speaker um, cabinet with sound producing elements, and that if you can get the sound producing elements close enough together so that the, um, they're no further apart than I think it's the, I'm going to forget the technology here, but uh, the, so to get them close enough that the lowest frequency that comes out of them is uh, longer wavelengths than the distance between them. Basically you've tricked, you tricked your mind into thinking all of those components are coming from one place. And he designed a system, um, uh, the Vita system that fulfilled both of those. Uh, it was just a really clever way of putting a bunch of speakers together. And before that we'd, we just sort of threw speakers up in the air and pointed them at places yeah. and optimized them the best we could. Um, that was game changing. I think that, that, that raised the level of, of, uh, audio quality, oh, yeah. uh, hugely. Um, I, I'll never forget the first tour I saw where they were using line arrays. It was, I think it was Genesis and I saw them at giant stadium or something mm-hmm. and they said, Oh yeah, you'll be able to hear everywhere. I'm like, uh-huh, sure. You mm-hmm. know, and, and you get to the show and it's like, well, this sounds like a record. Like this is mm-hmm. amazing. Yeah. 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 That, that was one. Um, and then really what, uh, digital consoles making their way into live was the, the second thing that was really game changing that, uh, early two thousands kind of when you started to see them, yeah. you know, really, really getting out there. Sure. And, uh, well, um, di- digital consoles have made a big difference in, in club bands too. I mean, yeah. That's huge. For sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. I saw a video with you or, or might've been an article and you were talking about your, I think it was the rush documentary. And actually I think you were talking about how um, you have your own ritual where you just kind of stand during sound check and just kind of close your eyes and kind of let the, you let the room and you let, you know, what you have ready to go kind of wash over you. And you just kind of have that moment where you kind of calibrate your brain to the room. Mm. You remember what I'm talking about? Uh, I I think that's, that's kind of what I was saying. There's a couple things, uh, rituals that I have, one of which is, um, and I think it's just the way maybe just my brain works, but I think the thing you're referring to is, uh, um, before the first song, I mix the first song in my head. Um, I think a lot of what happens when the show first starts 
it can be a little chaotic. And um, part of it is you're trying to catch up to, to uh, what's going on, what's actually going on on the stage. And, and in some ways you might be fighting the band, but if you've already sort of gone through the motions of what the first song is before you start, the, before the show starts, like, I mean, literally like, okay, uh, first I unmute this and then I turn the music down and the house lights go out and then I do this and, and just kind of stepping through it. You're prepared for what happens when makes sense, the yeah. show actually starts. And it is kind of like, well, you're, in, you're just more of a state. You're just more of a state of calm. So whatever happens, you're, you're ready to, yeah. whatever happens, it's not those things that you ordinarily do. You're ready to address it. So um, smart. The, oh. And I, actually, talking, I was talking to the drummer of the band, Queensryche, this was, about the jitters before the first show, before the first song when you go out there. And I suggested it to him because I don't know where I'd heard it, some someplace I'd heard to do that. And he started doing it and he, he came back to me and said, wow, it was, it was a huge that I'm not nervous anymore Like yep. when the show starts. like I actually know what's supposed to happen. So if something happens that's not that, you're... Yeah, you can you can focus on that. No, I started doing that with theater shows, um, you know, playing something complex where there's a lot going on. Right. I mean, it's a production. There's it's Mm -hmm. not just the band. It's like there's a whole lot of things happening. And if something gets screwed up, I got to keep trucking. And um, yeah, thinking through and just reading if if it's a theater show, just reading through the part like, oh, yep, we're going to hit that. Okay, Mm -hmm. yep, here Mm -hmm. we are. Okay, now I'm ready. I think it's I think it's that same that same thing is yeah. uh, that you're just you, your mind is already in the show you're in it and yeah. and, and whatever you, and you're prepared to take so instead of like oh wait what am i supposed to do now you're you've done it and you're you're just ready to take on whatever little blips might come along the other thing i try to do is at some point i try to find some time to step away from the console because i find for myself that it's almost like a right brain left brain thing like if i'm at the desk and there's a knob or a fader I listen to the show in a different way than I do. If I just step 10 feet off to the side and just close my eyes and listen. Yeah. Um, so I really try to find like, there's, there's two levels of, of mixing quality. One is just sort of overarching sounds good, you know? And the other is this like, Oh, there's kind of too much 5k on the hi hat level. I think if you find yourself a time to step away and just sort of take in the show, um, you turn on a part of your brain that addresses that, hey, it sounds, it, you know, luckily, usually it sounds pretty damn good overall. But I think you can get bogged down. Yep. When you have your hands on the knobs, you can get bogged down to some details. Speaking, that yeah. Honestly, are not making any difference in the overall, in the grand scheme. Of <laughs> and, yeah. and they introduce some risk, right? I mean, yes. you, yeah. you know, as you're trying to search for something to do something, you are, you might just get the wrong thing, right? Yeah. If it I, ain't I broke, fix it till it is, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I, I got some advice from a, another engineer early in my career was he, he would start the show and he, he would start the show with his hands on his hips and let the band play half a song before he touched anything, uh, which I, I don't know if I'd advocate that exactly, but I get what he was doing. That it was like just let's just take in the show for a minute, <laughs> and, and before we start digging into, um, you know, little the little thing that's gnawing at you yeah. for yeah. for whatever reason. You know, well, I love I love hearing about these rituals of yours. I, I recall a conversation, and maybe I think it was when we had a few seconds during that Shania Twain sound check, mm-hmm. and I was saying, you know, I'm starting to play in bands again, and and. Uh, you know, man, it's just so loud on stage. And I don't know if you remember, but you were saying, dude, it's all about the drummer. The drums are the loudest acoustic thing on stage. Everything revolves around, you know, finding a mix that, that satisfies the drummer being comfortable and, you know, sound on stage, everyone be able to hear themselves. You remember that conversation? Yeah. 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 And it, I actually had uh, an experience with a band. I, I turned the PA off and went and stood. It was a, a a club and I, I'm going to forget the band, but I remember it was, you know, two guitars, bass and drums and a singer. And I w- went up to the band and um, just stood sort of in front of the stage and they were playing and, you know, you hear the drums cause you're 10 feet away and uh, you could hear one of the guitars. And I, and I was like, well, actually the bass and the guitar, that guitar and the drums are balancing out pretty well, but the other guitar player, you can't hear him. I remember tur- turning him and asking him to turn his guitar up. I, I thought he was, <laughs> he's gonna die. He was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, well, just, you know, just get, just get a balance of what's going on here on the stage. And then, um, 
I mean, frankly, that works a lot better in a, a, a small space sure. than a, an arena, but uh, I know the monitoring at that gig was not especially sophisticated. So, um, yeah, I think there's, there's something to, let's just get you guys balanced out and not, and then we'll worry about the PA. Yeah. Yeah. Did you do, um, did you do like um, a tour preview thing in, in Los Angeles with the Hollywood vampires? That was a club level type of gig. Uh, oh yeah. 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 Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. The rain. So you're mixing clubs again. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. Joe with Joe Perry on the stage. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, that was oh, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen yeah. him in clubs recently. He likes to be loud. Yeah. He is not quiet. Yeah. Let's yeah. put it that way. Yeah. Crazy. So my question is a large number of the people who listen to us play clubs or play, you know, small venues. What can you reach back into your bag of tricks and offer us some, some good tips, some good advice for, for, you know, the semi-professional sound engineer. And again, the guy in my band was just someone, he was the only guy available. And so over the time he had to learn his craft, uh, you know, his first job was, you know, just don't learn anything feedback. And then after that, he got yeah. progressively better. Right. But what would you tell, what would you tell club, you know, cover band mixing engineers? Well, I mean, I think one thing we get sort of bogged down in, and I, I'm guilty of this is, is uh, we have a PA that's, in a small space that's not maybe not powerful enough or maybe too powerful in some ways, but that we get bogged down in inputs that really aren't the primary focus of the people that are coming to see the show. And I'm talking specifically about super powerful kick drum and non-existent vocals. Uh, I think it's really important to have the frame of mind of the, of the fan who's coming to see the band, they want to hear the singer and not, you know, and not, I mean, kick drum is exciting and drums are in general, are, it's exciting to have that power, but it can't overtake. Oh, the vocals have to win. Yeah. Vocals always have to win and guitar solos have to be heard. So, I mean, yep. your primary thing you have to address is, uh, is, um, you know, let's get the vocal out front and, and let's get the guitar solos up so people hear them and, and the drums and bass audible at first. And then maybe you can work on yeah. making those things a little bit more exciting. I, I would say also, I've, I've, I don't know so much anymore. Club PAs are a lot better than they used to be also, by the way. But, so way I remember better. my, my experience was going into clubs and, and whoever had been there had just EQ'd the PA to death. <laughs> and, you know, you're pulling power out when you do that. Um, uh, because people primarily just cut things that they don't like. And then, then the frequency next to it is too loud. So they cut that also. And sometimes you just have to let it, you have to balance out the, well, maybe there is a little bit too much one K in here, but if you pull it out, that's kind of all you have, you know, if the PA is really mid rangey and you just suck all the mid range out. You're not left with much. Uh, so mm live with the, and especially when those, we talk about those frequencies that are guitar and vocal frequencies, you might want to leave some of that in and let the kick drum suffer a little bit. It's not the most important thing. Yeah. Right. Right. No, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. If your PA only has that one K, if that's its sweet spot, let it sing so that people little, can at least yeah. hear a little. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Huh. All right. So, um, uh, uh, uh and if you have more of those tips, you will take them. Uh, but <laughs> yeah. I, I do also want to ask about hearing protection. Uh, it's a hot topic for us here. It's something I've been focused on since I was 14 years old. Thank goodness. I read a silly article. It wasn't silly. I read an article with Alex Van Halen when he was talking about uh, how he had lost so much of his hearing. And I decided at that moment, start wearing earplugs. But that's a mm. journey. It's not an easy thing to adapt to. You need to be able to hear but you also need to be able to hear. So right. how do you, how do you, how do you balance that? Well, my understanding, and I'm, I'm not an audiologist, sure. I've been doing this for a while, but my understanding is it's, it's volume over time. So yep. you can take, you know, 10 minutes of fairly loud and you're going to be okay. And then you want to do something to, to mitigate that. And um, then, so the question is, well, what do you do? So if you're just sitting in, and I would say also that people generally speaking mix too loud. Uh, I think you, it's more likely to ruin a show by just ramming it. Although occasionally that's all you've got. That, that, that's so. what, that's what the Mahavishnu orchestra did and it worked for them. But yeah, yeah. that was the old days with bad PAs. So yep. yeah. 
Well, and I think here's another trap we are falling into. I think is that PAs used to distort a lot, and um, and so you would mix up to a let's just I throw out 102 dB just for a number, right? Which is you know pretty pretty loud. Pretty loud, yeah. Um, well, they took all the distortion out of the PAs or most of it, and now you're sitting at 102 and you're going, you know, it's not that loud, <laughs> and you so you turn it up until it feels like it's loud again. Well, now you're at 105, uh, so you got to. First of all, me- as an engineer, you should measure where really where are you like objectively measure your level, and um, I think over long periods, ninety seven dB is loud enough, even you know in substantially big shows. Uh, there may there are going to be times when it's a lot louder than that, and be times when it's quieter than that. Yep. Uh, so and um, but over an average, I'd say that's that's a pretty 97 98 sort of a good number to shoot for uh but you're doing five shows a week and you know that's still a lot of exposure so really the question is how do you how do you uh lower your level of exposure uh there's two approaches well three i guess i would say if you walked by front of house on any given moment and saw me listening to my headphones you'd probably think i was soloing something most of the time i'm just got my headphones on um or maybe I'm soloing something quietly or listening to the mix quietly. Uh, as far as actually putting protection in, uh, I guess there's two approaches. One is to spend a lot of money on a, a pair of flat yeah. in-ear, uh, in-ear uh, earplugs. It's not um, that much money. I mean, we're talking yeah, a couple uh, hundred bucks. So. Well, I would say whatever it is, it's worth doing. Right. If, if that's the route you go. Yeah. I actually like to wear foam earplugs mm. and I'll tell you why this is my rationalization. That's what most of the people in the audience are wearing. If they're wearing anything. Huh. And to me, if I put those in, I'm actually have a reference that if anybody's in the audience wearing hearing protection, I have a reference for what they're hearing. Um, so both, I mean, it's perfectly valid to buy yourself a pair of, of uh, in-ears. And do it. I mean, do it. I totally advise you to do it. Uh, but there's nothing wrong with monitoring with foamies in. I've done it a million times. And um, huh. just be aware. <laughs> that right. You right. Are, yeah, do, you're you not going to crank the, the 5K. Sounds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, but you are listening to something that someone in that audience is, is listening to. You're not, you know, I would say the fraction of the audiences that have spent significant money on, on in-ear plugs is tiny oh yeah i mean uh, to uh, low enough to be non-existent essentially so yeah that's that's a good point right anytime i pull out you know my earplugs at a show i'm the only one that has anything even remotely like that and and it always amazes me because people go to shows it's like you know it's only 200 bucks you're even 150 now but but that's a lot of money to spend yeah well if you just go to a show every right several months i mean you're probably not even gonna think about it um I would say, but either way you go, whatever you do, the question is how much time are you actually exposing yourself to more than uh, 85 or 90 dB? Yeah. And, um, you know, you have to keep it uh, below an hour for sure. Uh, and I, I think, you know, the rush is particularly tricky because the show's really long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that was always like, well, I mean, I have to go through big chunks of the show with, with something over my ears and uh, you know, headphones can be tricky too, because there's a lot of ambient noise and, and your temptation is to crank them up. That actually should be worse. So, well, that, uh, and that's the problem with wearing in ears as a performer, not, not in mm-hmm. your earplugs, but in your, mm-hmm. you know, monitors, monitors and speakers yeah. is if you, if you migrate to those after being used to loud stages with wedges and amps and drums, you, you can hurt your hearing worse with in-ear monitors if, if you're not aware and careful and, and mm-hmm. diligent. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely true. And that's where you need a good monitor engineer. Someone's yeah. looking out after you. Yeah. Yeah. You need somebody to tell you, no, not louder. I remember when I did, I did some gigs with you, Paul, and I asked, um, before Bill like gave me my mix on my iPad, I just asked him, I'm like, can you put a little more snare in? And uh, he's like, yeah, you got to be careful, man. I was like, oh, thank goodness for looking out for me. I said, I I always tell monitor engineers, crank this. If I'm playing too loud, crank the snare in my ears. Self-preservation will take over and I will I will lay back. And Mm -hmm. I I felt myself playing too hard. And it was like, oh, if I just give myself some snare, that'll that'll deal with it. But yeah. 
You're a drummer, right? Dave? I am. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Snare is a funny thing to me. It drums uh, in monitors. Um, it's by a mile the loudest thing. Right. And it's right in front of you. <laughs> I know. So. I, I, well, yes, I, but as soon as you, the weird thing, the reason is I've thought a lot about this. I, I obsess about hearing protection and, and I've been, I've been wearing in ears for 20 years now, which is mm -hmm. crazy to me, which is really important for a drummer. I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. But you know, you, and I, and prior to that, I was wearing earplugs. Like I, I can count on one hand, the number of gigs I've played on the drums without any hearing protection in, I mean, in my entire life, it just, thankfully I started that way, but you're right. The snare is the loudest thing, but, and it's the closest thing to your ear until you put a speaker in your ear. And now the guitar right. is louder, right? Especially a speaker that's blocking out like 30 DB or something. So at, and I, like I said, I found that, you know, I would hear vocals and guitars and it's like, Oh, this is outstanding. I wouldn't even put drums in my ears. It's like, what do mm -hmm. I need those for? Well, you know, you get three songs in and the guitar player turns and he's like, dude, did you have like a bad day? Like, what are you bashing it out for? <laughs> it's like, Oh, right. Yeah. I got to balance this. And so that's where that comes from for me is fair, fair enough. You know, it, it, it actually, I can play quiet and more nuanced and you know it really just some overheads is usually enough uh, for me I, I i've never been a fan of kick drum in my monitor even you know back in the wedge days you know i would get on a stage for like a battle of the bands and i'd hit the kick drum and i'd be blown off the drum stool and was like get, what who needs this but i guess the people like it it's fine people it's, like it yeah there's it nothing feels wrong good. with it it feels good no i and i've gotten more used to it now there are moments where it's like hey give me a little more of that yeah <laughs> So Brad, I got one more question for you. Yeah, of course. Um, so we we live in interesting times. Any prognostications about where we're going to see touring business and live music in the near term or medium near term or long term? Yeah. Um, well, so the straight answer is who knows, I guess. But uh, if I had to read the tea leaves, I think it's going to be maybe in the fall, I'll start seeing some smaller. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, smaller things theaters uh but i mean i if i was being optimistic i'd say august um uh as far as larger tours uh i'd say from what i'm seeing out there there's not nothing's going out this year um i mean and again i have no real inside knowledge yeah. as a lot of people know a lot more than i do but just sort of looking at you know it's you, you you can't do a large scale tour when three or four states have opened up. You know, sure. it's just not it's not uh, feasible. Yeah, uh, kind of needs to be more or less everyone has gone back to some version of normal. Yeah. Um, I am not optimistic for anything of any scale going out in twenty twenty, wow. uh, and if it does, it's going to be late in the year. Um, that makes sense. another yeah. problem. Another problem we're going to have again, and I'm, this is coming from a sound engineer, not a, not a promoter, but I see that, um, there's going to be a lot of, a lot of pent up demand for the venues, you know, uh, basketball may want to start early yeah. and do more, play more games. Um, uh, baseball is going to want to be in their place. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of people are going to be competing for, uh, slots in those venues. So the availability is going to be, Oh, that's a good point. Tricky, really tricky. And there's some logistical things. It, it sort of depends on how long they were, we are being advised to stay six feet apart from each other. I think that's kind of where, what it boils down to. And, um, that may, uh, you know, it may go away sooner. I don't know. It may, they may decide if everybody wears a mask, then you're cool or, uh, or I'm not optimistic that there's going to be just from what I've seen in my lifetime, there's going to be a uh, vaccine in the near future. If, right. if ever, I mean, it's possible that never happens. Um, but some of the other mitigation, I mean, you have to, the logistics of touring, I mean, you're on a, you know, you're in a bus with at least seven other people on a good tour and it's a small space and you, and you, you can't do that. As well, constructions as, of sets and, you know, load ins and load outs and these yeah, are team yeah. efforts in which people are closer than six feet together. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, you know, I think you might be able to do that on a large scale environment, building a show. It's possible. I could sort of imagine that, but not from traveling from one place to another. No way. 
man, I don't, I don't know how you do that. It gets um, really expensive well, if you do it. That's right. Yeah. Well, but also air, everybody air travel. You, you said buses, but you know, then there's air travel when you have to go farther. You were about to go out with Montley crew. Is that what you're, what that got canceled as a result of this? I have no official oh. information on that. Got uh, it. Um, all I could do is guess, but I mean, they're going to have the same problems of, yeah. I mean, if, if it's okay to have a concert in a baseball stadium, it's okay to have a baseball game. True. And, uh, you know, or an uh, arena, it's okay to have a basketball and a hockey game. So, well, but the difference there is you could have like money can be made. Let me, let me put this in the right frame of mind. Money can be made if a basketball team goes and plays to no one in that arena and yeah. it's broadcast live, right? Concerts do not currently anyway, uh, afford themselves that same, you know, the advertising revenue model for concerts uh, with TV commercials is not there yet. So, but actually this is an interesting um, transition. So your company Diablo digital, yeah. you sell, um, you record the live shows or, or do you do streaming events as well? Well, uh, our mission has always been to record and archive multi-tracks of live shows. Um, we're certainly looking hard at the streaming space now. I mean, it's, it's a lot of things have been thrown out there for how does returning to presenting concerts, how does that happen? And one thing that is definitely on the table is pay-per-view. So, um, you know, setting up, uh, setting up a show, a substantial show in a place without an audience and, and then selling views to that. I, I couldn't begin to speak to the economic sure, viability yeah. of that. I really have no idea, but I mean, it's, we're grasping at straws in some ways, you know, well, if, if but you can speak to the long, realities of the technical, yeah. you know, aspects of trying to deliver, you know, concert quality sound over the internet, right? To totally doable. At this point, it's totally doable. If you get into place with the right infrastructure yeah. uh, and it's being batted around. I mean, it's, you know, serious people are talking about uh, moving into, moving a production into some kind of a residency where you have a different band come in every week and play mm -hmm. and you sell, you sell the views to that. Um, oh, that's a really smart thing. Go set up, you know, a, 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 a theater. Live at Daryl's house. Yeah. A theater. Yeah, like a, somewhere. like on steroids, right, Paul, right. like that on steroids. In fact, that very thing came up in a conversation the other day. That makes sense. Yeah. Huh. But do you remember? It's more like it, to me, it's more goes back to like, um, Rock concert, those old shows from Oh yeah, yeah. Rock the last. Rock yeah, right. Yeah. Where where it's like um except that it's not we showed up with some cameras at a show. It's like purpose the show is purpose built for for uh, uh streaming or, or well, HBO or well, something like the, I don't know. Uh, the Austin City Limits the, the new theater yeah. that they built down in Austin there. I mean it's that's yeah. exactly what that theater's for. And oh by the way, you could fit a couple thousand people in the room if you want, but you you don't need them, you know. Yep. Right. And a couple thousand people doesn't pay for that. Nope. Uh, it's my impression. That's what they're, the money is in the uh, sponsorship. Totally. Yeah. yeah, I guess that's true. Yeah. So in that sense, there, there is, there is a model for it. The question is, is it a model that one band, not one venue or one TV series, but one band could take and actually move the needle uh, enough to, to make it worth their while to. to We're talking this? about the new normal here, right? I right? mean, I, I, the thing is all the three of us collectively, our experience is about the thrill of live music and experiencing that social moment of being amongst, uh, you know, a bunch of other people screaming, you know, just feeling the energy, feeling the vibe the task of translating that to a, a screen related performance. I mean, I would love to see my favorite people do something on screen, but it's, I, 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 you know, unless you can really bridge into something totally spacey, like a VR environment or something like that, where you, cause isn't that what live music is? You know, Brad, you've said well, 25 times in the past hour about how you paid attention to the experience of being right there and having that moment. How do you translate that? Well, I, I'm not sure you can, Paul. It, it's, but it may be a matter of this is all we can do. This is what, I yeah, mean, this is how it is. I mean, Fish does their, what, what, what the fans and now the band have, have uh, termed couch tour, right? Where they, they stream live 90% of the shows that they're doing. It, it, like, like you said, Brad, it all depends on the infrastructure of the venue. Is there enough bandwidth? And you know what? People love it. And people pay 20 bucks a night or whatever to watch this from their couch. So, yeah, I, I don't there. And uh, it is a problem, Paul. Definitely. It's a problem uh, getting how, you know, you lose that experience. But I mean, even doing that, 
requires getting 50 people together. It's yeah. not like, yeah. you know, it, it all happens. You know, we're not going to set up a, you know, five computers and do a zoom meeting of a show. It's got, it has to be cameramen. There have to be people to page the yeah. cables. There have to be people to put up the lights, and run the lights. And I mean, at, at this point, even doing what we're talking about doing it, at least in California, it's out, six months away. Maybe, I don't right. know. Um, maybe four, I don't know, but definitely not something we could do right now. It, it's possible. It could be done in Nashville, in the not too distant future or, Texas or Vegas, like, I mean, the other thing is Vegas, if Vegas opens up and that works for them, everybody in the world's going to go oh, yeah. do their residency in Vegas. I mean, right. there's only, there's only so many places you can play. Sure. You know? Yeah, well, we do. We live in, we live in strange times and, you know, I, I, I know musicians from small coffee shop musicians up to national international touring musicians are, are going crazy, missing getting out there and being able to play for people. So, well, I mean, that's the, the horrible fact is that the live entertainment industry is absolutely nothing happening right now. There's right. zero. It went from being what was probably going to be the best year in history to nothing. Um, uh, now, so I'm trying to be optimistic that I think that we're going to find some innovative ways to do live entertainment as this starts to open up and streaming is sort of an obvious alternative. We'll see if it happens and if it works, you know, like if it's something that people are interested in. Um, but it's going to require, first of all, it's going to require everybody taking a stake in it, which means that nobody can come in you know, swinging for their guarantee of you mm. know, $500,000. I mean, it's going to be a risk that everybody's going to have to get yeah, in there and true. try there's, and take. I mean, there's a reset. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it can't be a loss going into it. And I think that you're going to, from what I'm hearing, you're going to see a lot more from the promoters of you're playing for the door. Now you're not, we're not throwing $50 million at your tour. You know, we're going to, we're going to pay for, production expenses and then you're going to go in and if you sell tickets, you make money. I, I really read that in a lot of the, yeah. a lot of what they're saying. That makes sense. Yeah. 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 All right, Brad, I got one more magic question for you. Okay. One more. Yeah. <laughs> Back in high school, you were the, you were the the man in town. You were the best keyboard player in Palo Alto. And then when it's high school kids, oh, I don't have, know about that, have you <laughs> ever had a chance to play piano? Like you, when you made that switch to, to go into sound production, have, have any of the bands you've toured with let you play piano with them? Yes. Huh? Uh, well, um, uh, on the Queensryche, um here in the Now Frontier tour, they did a bit in the middle where they reorganized the stage a little bit. And there was a couple songs where the guitar player played piano. But while they were reorganizing the stage, and they, they wanted to make it look like a bar and uh, with a new drum kit up to the side, kind of like a sort of more stripped down version of the band playing they rolled out a piano and i walked from front of house onto the stage i put on i, I put on this like green horrible green lime green suit and they put a candelabra on the piano i went out and i played uh on not very long for maybe like a minute all by myself oh to my to i uh, played jazz piano to a crowd of heavy metal fans <laughs> that's <laughs> every awesome every night every night on that tour yeah i love that that's great, yeah. man. <laughs> it was it was a lot of fun, actually. They, I enjoyed working with those guys as well. It was a, a lot of fun that tour. Wow, well, awesome. this has been awesome, man. Thank you so much for uh, for coming and talking to us and our listeners and answering all our crazy questions. And yeah, of course, stories, anytime, man. guys. This is great. Yeah, Paul, you got anything else to ask, Brad? That uh, uh, that you want to be recorded? Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I mean, we don't get too much of a chance to catch up anymore. But uh, I just want to let you know, I'm just. As your buddy, I have just a lot of pride watching all the things that you've built in your career. I just, you know, you've risen to the top and uh, I just, I love you. And I'm just glad for all the things that you've accomplished. Thanks, Paul. Likewise. And you, you guys stay safe out there. That's the idea. So Brad, tell uh, tell people where they can find you. Tell us about uh, Diablo Digital or wherever you want people to, to find you these days. Uh, we have a little website. It's just DiabloDigital.com. It's uh, a lot of pictures. And at the moment, there's not a lot of activity, but you can always come, you can always email us there. And uh, um, 
Uh, cool. I don't know. Facebook is always a good place to catch up. So. All right. Good. Well, thank you again, Brad. And uh, thanks everybody for listening. You can, uh, if, if there was a question we missed, send it into us feedback at giggabpodcast.com. We might be able to tap Brad on the shoulder and maybe ask him a, a you know, a question or two after the fact. So absolutely. Uh, you rock, man. Thanks everybody. Thanks, Brad. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Have a good one. Always be Always performing. Always be performing. That's it.